Turn with me in your Bibles, if you will. Let's set a foundation. It is a familiar passage of scripture that we've used before. And we ask the Lord to use it in a different way tonight in the New Testament in 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. That's 2 Corinthians. If you don't go to church, it's 2 Corinthians. <laughs> 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Real simple, verse 14. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? With lawlessness what communion has light with darkness? Lord, we confess that sometimes we've found ourselves unequally yoked, not because they were darkness, but because we forgot we were light. I pray tonight that you would remind us of who we are and that everyone cannot be romantically and permanently attached to our lives. For someone, this is going to be difficult, God, because the heart wants what the heart wants. And I pray tonight that your spirit would guide and speak even above our own heart's desire. Lord, teach me to want better than what I've wanted and to desire more than what I've had. I believe that eyes haven't seen and ears haven't heard all the good things that are yet in store for us who love you. My heart's desire is for you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Hey, Marcus, can I have the red table over there? Thank you. Um, every February, realizing that Valentine's Day um, is on the way and relationships are in the air, um, I want to dedicate our Kaya to uh, dealing with Christian relationships. Um, and before uh, we get into it, I kind of have to survey the room to be certain that I'm speaking appropriately to the right people. So if you are married, would you wave your hand? If you're married, if you're married, Ooh, we one, two, three, four. All righty then. Um, uh, blessings to you. Uh, uh, so good. This message is for the right group of folk. Um, if now, wa watch this. If you're in a committed relationship, wave your hand. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh -huh. Put your hand up. Put your hand up. Yeah. <laughs> if you waiting on the Lord to deliver, amen. You waiting on God to... <laughs> amen. Um, given that it is apparent in this stage that many people are not rushing, I would pray for, but prayerfully discerning what God's will is when it comes to relationship and mate, um, about three or four years ago, um, the Lord put on my heart a teaching called Unequally Yoked. Um, and it's still one of my favorite um, Kaya sessions that we've had together um, because I think it deals with one of the most important areas of our young adult Christian lives as we are searching for possible soulmates and wives and husbands and those whom God has called to be with us in our life to realize that the Lord does not want you to be committed in a long-term romantic relationship with someone with whom you are unequally yoked. Um, and that's what Paul warns us of in 2 Corinthians 6 in the passage that we just read. The term yoked, for those who don't remember, it really is a farming ter term. It refers to um, a device that binds two oxen together so that they can plow a field that is in front of them. And what is necessary to plow the field correctly is that the oxen be equally yoked, that they have equal strength so that together they can get the work done that is ahead of them. To be unequally yoked means to be connected to someone who can't help you plow the field, someone who can't help you get the work done that is ahead of you, someone who may not be strong enough to complete the assignment and you wind up pulling more weight because you're tied with someone who's not helping you get the assignment done. Um, and that's all it means to be unequally yoked, that you are connected in a way that is unproductive for the work God has called you to do. 
Um, and because of that, I share with you that even though Paul is warning about spiritual, spiritually being unyoked, unequally yoked, meaning be careful of being in um, a relationship as a Christian with a Muslim or a Buddhist or an unbeliever. And that's not to say that those aren't good people. It's not even to say that they aren't godly people. It is to recognize that if you are serious about your walk with the Lord, it is possible that there be some undercurrents of issues that are not visible when you first get together that eventually will cause problems and cause that relationship to fall apart when you really get down to it. So we talked about the example of when children come into a, a marriage where there are different faith traditions. God bless those couples that have been able to make it. But that also becomes a real sticking point about how the child is going to be raised. Will the child be raised as a Muslim or will the child be raised as a Christian? Um, and those differing issues come up in circumstances. It's to remind us that at the onset when we meet people, there are things that are not visible that may really be a difference maker. Um, you know that when you meet someone, you don't meet the full them. Right? You meet the representative. Right? <laughs> you meet the best them. And everybody likes the beginning stages of relationships. That's the easy part. That's the fun part. That's the, you're digging down, and you're digging down, and then finally you dig down and realize there's some areas where you all are not yoked equally. I um, mean, for some of us, it becomes too late then. We're already stuck in that place. Our emotions are invested. Our sexuality is invested. And now we find out that there's some differences that may cause us not to be able to make it. And so I started our first series uh, by just sharing some of the ways you can be unequally yoked. This is just a quick reminder for those that may not have been with us some three, four years ago. You can be unequally yoked financially, and that has nothing to do with how much you earn. You can earn six figures and they earn you know, 40, 30,000. That doesn't mean that the relationship is doomed. Where the relationship becomes unequally yoked financially is when your perspective of money is different. Um, that for some people, money is a toy, and for others, money is a tool. And if money is a tool for you, used to build something, you wind up being yoked with someone for whom money is a toy, something just to enjoy and to play with, eventually you are going to realize you're not yoked together. Um, you're trying to build to save, to build up credit, to get a vacation home, and they're trying to wear Jordans, you know? <laughs> right? They're spending, and you're going to become frustrated when you're saving and they're spending and, and wearing everything they earn all the time. Um, that can be an area that causes a real disagreement in a relationship. You can be unequally yoked in your anger management. Um, it's okay, I, I'm not gonna say it's okay, but I know, I know couples that cuss and yell and throw stuff, right? But if they both cuss and yell and throw stuff, <laughs> right, they're okay with it, right? right? All right, that's just what we do, and you know some folks, all right, and as soon as this is over, it's over, and they move on. But it's dangerous and difficult when you're not a cursor, a yeller, and a thrower, and you find out that the person you are with is, then you find yourself unequally yoked because now you're living in a state of fear. Whereas cursing for them may be natural. You being cursed at puts your walls up. Um, and I've always said in a relationship, you never really know someone until you see them angry. Right? Just, just believe that. You, you, who you see on Valentine's Day is not who they are. <laughs> Wait until they are gravely disappointed and they're angry and then you'll find out who they really are. You can be unequally yoked in your socialization. Um, if you are one that has kind of grown out of the need for being out of the house all the time, but you're yoked to someone who's got to go out all the time, that's going to cause a problem. If, if you're working and you go to bed at 9.30 because you got to get up at 6, and they like leaving the house at 1 to go out, it's going to be a problem. <laughs> right? Right? If, if you... <laughs> You know, if you hit park once a month and they go once a week, <laughs> right, right, it's going to be a problem. Um, that at a certain stage, for me, I need to know you're OK being at home by yourself. Um, I don't need to be on the road preaching or working. And since I'm gone, you got to be out running the streets. Um, that's a problem for me. 
So you can be unequally yoked socially, you can be unequally yoked in your ambition for your careers. Um, it's, it's difficult being in a relationship when you've got a grind and an ethic that wakes you up at six in the morning to conquer the world, and you're with someone that doesn't mind going in late, that's content just being at whatever level they are, they're just trying to cruise control, they don't wanna do anything new, don't wanna apply for anything new, and there's nothing wrong with that, but it is wrong when you all don't have the same level of ambition for your careers. Uh, people with a grind and an ethic appreciate people with a grind and an ethic. Um, it's difficult because ultimately you will start to disrespect the one you're with because they don't work as hard as you. I mean, you'll look at them as being lazy. And when that sets in, it's almost impossible to get it out. You can be unequally yoked in terms of your fitness and health um, and how you care for your body. Um, if you work out and are vegan and you know, you're doing the thing, and you're yoked to someone who likes KFC and sits on the couch, <laughs> eventually you'll become disgusted watching someone let themselves go, right? When you're trying your best to keep yourself up, um, when you are serious about health and well-being, and you're connected to someone who isn't, you lose respect, and you can be un unequally yoked in that way. And then, of course, spiritually, uh, which we kind of mentioned. All this is to say that there are some difficulties and differences that you need to take seriously before you commit yourself to someone. Um, there's some things that you ought to have on your radar that you want to know, are we equally yoked in this area? Um, I have now found, as I was preparing this, this lesson for tonight, that there really are two forms of being unequally yoked. There are two forms of being unequally yoked. The first is you can be unequally yoked when you're connected to someone. Remember, it's a farming device, and you have to be equally strong to plow the field. You can be unequally yoked when you're connected to someone who's not strong enough to plow the field you're trying to get through. Right? Someone who just doesn't have the same ambition, the same concern, the same perspective of money. And it doesn't mean they're weaker. It just means that they're not moving in the same direction. But the Lord revealed to me that there's an even more dangerous way of being unequally yoked. And that is when you're connected with someone who's determined to dominate control and direct the plowing even at the expense of damaging you. Um, so it's not necessarily that I'm connected to someone weaker. I may be connected to someone who's just more set on controlling the direction we move in and yanking me even when that's not the direction I'm trying to go in. Um, that you are connected to a controller. Um, it's dangerous, it's destructive, and it's deadly to be connected to someone who's more concerned about things going their way than the mutual benefit of you both. Um, controllers are dangerous. And the Lord has never called you to be yoked to someone who controls you. We're looking for helpmates. We're looking for those who assist. We're looking for those who encourage. The Lord has never called you to be in connection and relationship long-term romantically with someone who believes their godly assignment is to control you. Okay? Hear me. A godly relationship requires three things. You know, and I'm not talking spiritual now, so let's just assume we're putting prayer up there and y'all read the Bible and go to church. We're going to Assume that. Okay. But there are three other things that are absolutely necessary to make a relationship work. Number one is reciprocity. Um, that one of the things God demands for a relationship to exist is that both parties contribute and receive equally to and from one another. That you're both equally committed to caring, maintaining, and repairing the relationship. Caring, maintaining and repairing the relationship. There has to be reciprocal honesty, reciprocal caring, reciprocal listening, reciprocal responsibility, reciprocal decision-making, and reciprocal effort and change. If you're the only one changing, if you're the only one apologizing, if you're the only one listening, if you're the only one yielding, if you're the only one sacrificing, 
if you're the only one going through all the hoops to give all the effort, you are unequally yoked. And that is displeasing to the Lord. The Lord wants to partner you with someone who is equal to you. Someone who brings to you the same that you would bring to them. The person who cares for you the way you care for them. Because what makes a godly relationship work is when I release myself from having to take care of me and totally focus on taking care of you and believe that your full commitment is to take care of me. So I'm cared for by you, you're cared for by me. I don't have to fight for my own well-being because I know you're doing that, right? And if that isn't equal, if I'm giving more for your well-being than you're caring for mine, then we're unequally yoked and now I gotta take care of myself. And I can't fully release myself to the marriage or to the relationship to care for you. There's gotta be reciprocity. Number two, there's gotta be freedom. In a relationship that is pleasing to the Lord, you must have the freedom to make choices, challenge decisions, give input, express feelings, disagree, and pursue your purpose without fear. If you can't challenge decisions, if you can't give input, if you can't disagree, if you can't express your feelings without the fear of being hurt, you are being manipulated and you're in a relationship where you are unequally yoked. You should never fear being ridiculed, ignored, abused, or punished by someone you say you love. You should never be afraid of being ridiculed, ignored, abused, or punished by someone you say that you love. That is not a godly relationship. And finally, it requires authenticity. A godly relationship is one where the Lord has partnered you with someone who helps further who the Lord made you to be, not what they want you to be, right? So that in this relationship, what I'm pursuing is what I perceive God's call on my life, who I should be, and you are partnered with me to help me become that, not to help change what God created me to be. If you're in a relationship where you are constantly feeling as if you are changing yourself, then you're not where the Lord wants you to be. God has never called you to be with someone who has the bigger vision for what you ought to be than what God had. Right? So your woman, your man, cannot be the vehicle that God shares what God wants you to be, and they're coming in telling you what you need to be. Change ought to be internal from our own sense of walking with the Lord, not from our sense of trying to please somebody else. Because when I'm my best me and my godly me, then that ought to be enough to be attractive to you. And if my best me and my godly me is not enough for you, then we're not meant to be together. Amen. Right? Amen. Okay. So I want to ask you 15 quick questions before we get started. Um, <laughs> this, is, this is not, it's not what you think. Um, there are serious questions that help you wonder, are you in an unequally yoked situation? Um, if your answer to these 15, if one of them is no, that's not so bad. If you answer two no's, you might want to be concerned. If you have more than three, I'm telling you, you're unequally yoked. Here are the questions. Does the person you're with make sacrifices for your needs above their own? Do you believe that they have your best interests in mind even when it causes them to sacrifice? Do they ask your opinion about things before making decisions that affect you? Do they trust you when they don't know where you are? Amen. <laughs> Number five, do they take responsibility and apologize when they're wrong? Number six, are they considerate of your feelings? Do your feelings matter to them? Number seven, when you have a problem, are they eager to listen and try to fix it? 
Number eight, do they seek out and listen to wise counsel? Number nine, do they allow you to be yourself? Number 10, do they allow you to make your own decisions? 11, do they accept your disagreement on issues? 12, do they try to understand why you feel the way you do? Number 13, are they comfortable with you receiving and giving attention to others in their presence? Say that again. <laughs> Are they comfortable with you giving and receiving attention to and from others when they are in your presence? Are they comfortable with you receiving praise or compliments from other people? And do they listen and acknowledge the validity of issues when you raise problems? By definition, you all, Controllers are three things. Look at you say, amen, I'll raise this. They're narcissistic in the sense that they need things to revolve around them. It will always try to turn things in their favor, from their perspective, and for their needs. Um, controllers always place themselves above you. And you'll find that very rarely is the issue really about you but they're gonna make the issue about what's best for them. They are escapists, uh, meaning that they very seldom take responsibility for anything. Um, somehow, some way, it's always going to be your fault. Um, and they are manipulative. Um, they are able to twist and turn things in ways that make you the guilty party just about all the time. So what I wanna do for the next few moments and then pause and see if we have some questions. So AV, we may want to get some mics down in just a moment, Bobby. Um, I want to share with you seven types of controlling personalities um, and some of the manipulative tactics that they use in hopes that number one, you will be able to identify when someone is trying to control you through emotional tactics. Number two, that maybe you might be able to help a friend who's in a controlling relationship see how they're being controlled. And number three, identify if you are a controller. Because some of us are gonna be guilty of some of the stuff that's up on the screen. Uh, don't say amen, just look straight ahead and just. <laughs> Girl, he talking to you, he talking to you. Um, and then next week, I mean next month, given that we're spending tonight examining this, I want to share with you some ways to handle um, that if tonight the Lord reveals to you that you're in something that is not of God's will and is a controlling, dominant person, um, how do we begin to walk away from that? Um, how do we break away from those? So let's talk about a few demanding personality types. Um, I want to put seven up on the board um, and then we'll be done. Seven types of controllers I think you need to avoid. Number one, the demander, the taker. This is the person that demands that you support and sacrifice for their life above and beyond the contributions they make for yours. In banking language, this person makes more withdrawals than they do deposits. Uh, they demand that you give more than they even attempt to give you. They ask for more than they even try to give. And then they make you feel bad for not being there for their needs. Um, if what they need from you conflicts with your own schedule in life, they become angry. If you're not there when they call, if you don't answer, this is the, I've called you three times, you were in a meeting, you couldn't step out, but now they're pissed because they needed you and you weren't available. You'll hear them say things like, you're selfish, or it's always about you and you never try to take care of me. 
The danger with a taker or a demander is that you're never going to do enough. They will always demand more. And one of the things that they will do, they will occasionally compliment you and appreciate something you've done, but they don't do it regularly. They do it very sporadically so that when you receive it, it's kind of like finding water in the desert. You're so grateful that you finally were acknowledged that you will keep trying harder and harder. And by trying harder and harder with a demander and a taker, you're only feeding the problem because you will never do enough. And they keep you strung along by giving you just enough affirmation at the right time so that you don't walk away. And then you go right back into a season of never being acknowledged for the things that you do. Um, demanders don't like demands put on them. Takers don't like you to ask for things for them. A demander and a taker you can identify because they would typically exaggerate the little things that they do. They'll do minimal things for you. They'll keep a list of every single thing they've done. <laughs> and they will expect you to repay them for everything they did. Well, I put the dishes up three years ago. They have, they have a very acute memory of minor things. You can tell a demander because if they did something years ago, you're probably still hearing about it. <laughs> They're still bragging about something little that you've done a thousand times and they did it once and expect you to pay them a thousand times over from it. Um, they like to receive much more than what they give. And when you're in a relationship with a demander or a taker, there's no reciprocity. There's no equal giving. There's no equal sharing. And God cannot be in the midst of that because you're with someone who's literally draining you of everything and expecting you to be grateful for giving it and will guilt you when you're not there when they need you to be. Um, these are the people that control you through your sense of wanting to give. Uh, they latch on to generous spirits. They lack on to calm, peaceful spirits. They lack on to caregivers. And remember, especially sisters, remember, dating should not be a mission project. Right? That you are not trying, you're not trying to make him a man. You're not trying to solve his problems. Okay? Hush. These are the people, have you ever met people who have no sense that asking you for something is inappropriate? <laughs> like that there, there's certain things you should not ask me for given where we are in this relationship. You, know, you have friends like that. You wanna borrow my car? <laughs> Felicia, most folks come around and ask for bread and sugar. You come here talking about you and borrow my car? <laughs> Some of y'all too are young. You don't even know that's right. right. Yeah. Um, the demander believes that there's nothing inappropriate to ask, um, that you ought to be able to give the world to them, but they're very unwilling to even give you an ounce of time. Be very aware of someone that's asking but never volunteering. I've got to be careful because you may believe that if I ask and they give, that that's a good sign. No, at some point they ought to instinctively know how to give back. This is a gratitude problem. This is a fundamental problem with someone that you're not going to fix by doing more. And doing more will only leave you broke. Watch out for demanders. Number two, and I know you already know these because you've met these kind of folks. Mr. and Mrs. Always. How many of y'all know somebody that's always right? right? If your hand ain't raised, it might be you. 
the difficulty with these people, these are people that are experts on everything. When they speak, they speak with absolute certainty as if there's no room for any different opinion, perspective. We laugh, this is your president, right? And there are those who are attracted to that type of personality. He's never wrong in his own mind. Huh? Y'all, he really believes the things he says. Right? He believes he's the best president the United States has ever seen, that he's done more in one year than any president has ever done before him. And you and I both know the way the machinery of America works there's nothing you start in January that reaps fruit by January. <laughs> There's nothing you can do to change a society overnight. You are reaping the work of the one who came before you and taking credit for what you could not have done. But this mindset says, I'm always right. And in relationships, these are, this is dangerous because the person subconsciously treats you as if they are the teacher and you're the student. They will ignore your opinion and you'll find out whenever there's conflict, it turns into not different ways of seeing things, but who's right and who's wrong. This is the type of person who will trivialize and almost paint your opinion as being ignorant because they know what's best. They are always right. They're dangerous because they rob you of two things you need in a relationship. They rob you, number one, of your ability to interpret events in your life and share how you see things and they will invalidate how you see things if it doesn't line up with how they see it. That somehow or another you just got it wrong, you missed it. Or even worse, they invalidate your feelings. That you don't have the right to feel the way you do. That your feelings are wrong. Hear me, beloved, feelings are neither right nor wrong, they're just real. It's just how I feel. Now, they may be detached from some factual truth that we need to talk about, but you know what it's like to be in a relationship with someone where you have to argue to validate the way you feel. And that will drive you crazy when you have to constantly argue for your right to be upset. I don't like, you, you, you don't have the right to be upset. I have the right to be whatever the hell I want to be. <laughs> now, now, you may not like it, and I might admit that it's not based on fact, but right now, the last thing I want to have to do is argue with you that I have the right to feel the way. If I want to be mad, I'm mad. If, you, if I didn't like it, I didn't like it. Now, we can talk about it, but don't tell me I don't have the right to dislike something you did. All right? Okay. But the person who's always right, they'll be right at no matter what cost, even if it's the cost of offending you. And very seldom will they concede that they were wrong about something and they will always rob you of your authenticity. That you can't be who God made you to be, including the way you feel, because they've got to change it to align it with what they see. The greatest addiction that destroys a marriage is the addiction to being right. I've said before, looking back on my own experience, some people just don't have the strength to be married because you've got to have the strength to sacrifice the ability to be right. You got to be able to say, I was wrong. You got to be able to take the loss and it not matter. Right? This is not a win-lose. This is a we win together or we lose together. Right? But if you are still addicted to being right, and that's, I think that's the danger of getting older in life and have never been in long-term relationship, never been married. By the time you reach 50, you are so set in your ways right? that it's hard for you to have someone come in your house and show you another way to do something, mm-mm. <laughs> ain't how this work over here. <laughs> um, um, 
the Mr. and Mrs. Wright. Number three, the button pusher. The reason number three is, is right after number two because there are some people, and I put this right there with the experts, there are some people who are not only experts in everything, they think they're experts in you. Right? They know how you should think, how you should feel, they know your faults, and they learn your buttons. These are dangerous people because these are people who know how to get under your skin and they do it intentionally. The reason they do it intentionally is to pull an emotional response out of you so that you become overly emotional. And you'll watch this, you'll know a button pusher because while you're escalating, they're intentionally staying calm. Why, why do they do that? Why, why try to get you emotional? And they'll push and push and push to make you emotional while they stay calm because the end result of a bus reporter is this. Why are you so agitated? <laughs> Here's the button pusher. You're the one yelling. <laughs> I'm just raising an issue. I'm keeping calm. The button pusher is dangerous because they want to put themselves in a position where they can argue, you're the problem. Here's how button pushers work. Button pushers are so controlling and narcissistic, they will try to persuade your family you're the real problem. Huh? He always blows his top. She can't handle real conversation. She's always all over emotional. And they position themselves in a place where they have the upper hand because they got you to respond emotionally, even though they're the ones that push the button. They want to blame you. They want you to look crazy. And they'll even use other people to get an emotional response out of you. Button pushers are quick to bring into conversation or relationship people they know you don't like. He will mention the woman he knows you can't stand to start the ball rolling. It's the button push, and you've got to be careful of allowing people to manipulate you by thinking they can control your emotions and push your buttons. You've got to know your own buttons and refuse to allow them to be pushed, right? I'm not going to lose my cool over that. The button pusher. I'm going to tell you who I've dealt a lot with in my life, the deflector, the person who uses a smoke screen. These are the people that will avoid the issues brought to the table by always flipping it back on you. Here is a deflector. A deflector will be offended by something you did in a relationship but won't say anything. They will wait until you're offended and bring something up. And then in order to deflect your offense, they will remind you of what you did. Right? Here's, here's the deflector. You say to them, well, you know, I didn't appreciate when you did this. Well, I didn't appreciate when you did, uh, you know, I, right? So now it's the tit for tat thing, right? And they hold on to it. Listen. And so I'm, I'm quick in, in, in conversation, in relationship, say, listen, okay, you know what? If that's what you want to do, we'll talk about what I did, but as soon as we're done, we're coming back. <laughs> because what deflectors wind up doing is they take you down side streets and you never get to the destination of a resolution of an issue you brought. You brought A and B to deal with. They took you down C and D all the way to Z, and now your issues have never even been dealt with. These are the people in conversational languages, um, theorists that say it's called conversational gumbo. Do you know what gumbo is? It's just when you throw everything in you got, right? 
So you're, you're trying to resolve an issue and they're just throwing in anything that they've got issues with, anything they've been holding on to, anything they're not pleased with, and now you've not created anything but gumbo because all you've done is thrown everything into a pot and everybody's going away. The deflector is okay, but you're not. Because again, the narcissistic one doesn't want the issue coming to them. So what I've got to do is find a way to divert it and put it back on you. Um, your feelings are never dealt with. Your issues are never really brought to the table. When you're hurt, somehow you're wrong for being hurt. Right. Right? You shouldn't feel this way after everything I've done and yada yada. Next thing you know, you're on the defense when you brought a hurt to the table. Um, they don't deal with the real issue. It gets deflected and diverted. The button pusher, the deflector, some of you know the prison guard. <laughs> right? This is the brother or sister who wants to control everything about you and will tell you it's for your own good. <laughs> they believe in their heart that controlling everything is good for you. Who you talk to, who you go out with, what time are you going to be back, who's contacting you on social media. <laughs> this person literally believes they are protecting you, but they're really trying to possess you, to own everything. And you can tell a prison guard because they always seek to isolate you. Here's the prison guard mentality. You can't be closer to anyone than you are to me. And they will try to get you to believe that your relationship with your best friend for 20 years is somehow detrimental to our relationship. You shouldn't be talking to your sister like that. Your mother is bad for us. There's this attempt to isolate you from the people who've loved you and cared for you, and they will cause you to make a decision between your relationship and other relationships you've had that help shape who you are. As if all of a sudden, those people are bad for you. And they justify themselves in bad behavior. These are the folk who will follow you, The folk who will go through your phone. Okay, let, let me speak to some people for just a quick minute. I gotta get this. I need to unload this off my spirit. Okay. By the time you go through someone's phone, it's already over. It, it's already over. And if he or she has to provide their phone for proof, you already have a deeper issue than you think. It's a trust issue. And you've got to be careful of those who think that they're doing the best thing for you. Now, statistically, it has been proven that prison guards and relationship are trying to possess and control everything because nine times out of 10, they're cheating. If you're with someone who's trying to control and look through everything, nine out of 10 times, they're cheating. And what are they doing by accusing you? Deflecting. Because now you're not suspect of me, I'm suspect of you. And what's on the table is your fidelity, not my infidelity. Now the danger with these is that not only has it been proven that they cheat, but it's been proven that these are the ones who are the quickest to become physically violent. These are warning signs early. If you sense a controlling spirit of someone who wants to control everything and does inappropriate things, these are the ones who typically become physically violent the quickest. Make note of the prison guards. Number six, we're almost done for some questions. Oh man, I've had enough of these. Um, <laughs> I 
the victim. This is a very subtle emotional manipulative tactic that paints someone as always being in need. And they count on your desire to be caring and compassionate to cater to them. They're always injured. There's always something that they need you to do for them. And if you love me, Y'all, there's nothing wrong with being wanted, but there's something wrong with being needed. There's something wrong with someone who always needs you and can't be stable without you. I need, you, I need to know that your world doesn't come crashing down if I'm at Kaya till 9 o'clock and I'm not available. If my phone is off and I'm asleep, I need to know you can make it through the night. <laughs> yeah. Call on Jesus. <laughs> I know he'll answer. <laughs> so I was preparing this lesson, doing some reading, and the author I was reading said, here's how you can identify a victim very easily. There are a few things you need to watch for. Number one is what he called the Trojan horse effect. The Trojan horse, you remember the, the mythology of the Trojan horse? The soldiers are inside the horse, the horse looks like a gift, they let the gift inside the city, and then the soldiers come out. It's a way of deceptively getting inside. So here's what he says, you can, be, you can identify a victim because too early on in the relationship, they will begin to identify injuries as a way of getting into your heart. Too early on, they allow you to know they were victimized. Too early on, they let you know about pain they're still carrying as a way of getting into your heart, and then all the other stuff starts coming out. And by now, it's too late because they think that you care and that you're compassionate. You shouldn't be bleeding on people in date one. <laughs> right? But these people know how to get you to become emotional for them. The difficulty with them is that eventually you become responsible for fixing things you didn't break. So a hurt inflicted on them by their bad relationship with their father somehow becomes your responsibility because they need you and they've now gotten the emotional response from you. Um, this person is dangerous because they expect you to sacrifice your destiny for their emotional well-being. That this is the person, let me, let me say this, how you, this is the person, when you get a sense that you need to end it, you feel like you can't because they're gonna be broken without you. And you don't want them to hurt like that. You care, you're a caring person, you're, you're a practicing Christian. trying to live out your faith um, and you don't want to leave them even though you know it's not good for you but their emotional well-being so you wind up sacrificing where God has called you to be so that someone else can be emotionally well now the author also said one of the best ways to identify and I never thought of this one of the best ways to identify a victim is listen to how they talk about their ex. Stay with me. Uh. It's okay to be angry over something, but be careful of someone who speaks of their ex in disrespectful ways as if this person isn't even human, as if all the fault was on them and they never speak about where they may have been at fault for the ending of the relationship. Because what a victim loves to do, catch me, a victim loves to draw a line in the sand and share with you, you have to hate them to love me. Right? That they're enemy. And if you're going to be with me, you have to see her as enemy. So he wants you to believe she was crazy and deranged and obsessive. 
so that before you even meet the sister, you hate her. Look at what she did to the man I care for. Victims love for you to be on their side. Victims want you to side with them against other people that they feel have hurt them because now you're more protective. Now you're protecting their emotions. Listen at how they speak about their exes. Now, I kind of buy into this, but I know some folk who are crazy <laughs> and deserve to be talked about the way that... <laughs> Only thing I did wrong was dating her. That's what I did wrong. That's what I'm <laughs> That was a mistake I made. You yeah. got to pray for you make some decisions these days. Uh, but they, they show that inner wound so quickly, and they blame others for it so that you now surround them and begin to care, and now you're stuck. Because when you realize that this is not healthy for you, that you're not someone's nurse, you're not in a relationship to help heal someone, and they keep pulling on you and needing you, next thing you know, you don't want to leave because you don't want to hurt them. Be careful of victims. Be careful of victims. And number ooh, we moved on. The Punisher, last one. The Punisher is the one who thinks that when you've done something they don't like, rather than talking about it, they need to teach you a lesson. And they're going to punish you. And punishment takes a whole lot of different forms. They can give you the silent treatment. How many of you have ever been in a relationship with, with this person? They're upset by something. And so they disappear and won't answer their phone for a day or two. <laughs> they send you the voicemail. All right. They're, here's the danger in this. Number one, it's an insult to you to be treated as if someone is your parent who ought to punish you as opposed to us developing the communication necessary to talk about the things that may have hurt us, offended us, or left a bad taste in our mouth, but now you just want to disappear. Now you're going out with your friends and I can't find you for three days. And you come back now, figuring have I learned my lesson? I sure have. <laughs> I have learned that we are unequally yoked. that there's no equality in that relationship. That's someone who believes that their job, their call from God is to change you as opposed to allowing you to change from within yourself. Um, punishment has no place in a godly relationship. Um, when you read about that godly love in 1 Corinthians 13, it keeps no record of wrong, it doesn't punish. Um, I'm not looking for, I have a mom, I don't need a mother. I need a helpmate. I need someone who helps me become the better me God wants me to be, but not someone who believes that their assignment is to teach me a lesson. I am the wrong one to think you're going to teach me a lesson. <laughs> Ooh, you ain't going to like that class. So let's wrap this up. There are some common themes I want you just in summary to be aware of, all right? Beware of those who lead you to believe that they're not responsible for their own actions, but you are. This is the look what you made me do to you. And your bad behavior cannot be excused by you blaming and guilting me. You have to take ownership of your own stuff. And you are nobody's whipping post. You are nobody's tool to be used. You have to take responsibility for you. Be careful of those who make you believe that you're the only one that needs fixing. I'm right and you're always wrong. If you're in a relationship where you feel you have to walk on eggshells, that's not a good thing. Where you can't speak openly and freely and know that if it comes out wrong, we can work it out. Be careful of those 
want to make you side with them against others. Be careful of those who make subtle comments that demean you. They make you feel like you're inferior or unintelligent or unworthy. Those that use guilt and shame and fear and need to keep you close. Those who trivialize your perspective and almost dumb down the way you see things. There are some dangerous people to be yoked with because as they try to control you, they pull you away from the field you've been called to plow by God. Now here's the good news where I close. If you are in a situation like this, here's the great news. There's nothing God can't deliver you from. There's no, there's no relationship that God can't pull you out of. And it may take some hard work. It may take some time alone afterwards to get yourself back together. But there's nothing God can't deliver you from. And here's the reality. You have to trust that the same God who takes care of you is a God who will take care of them. So if this has to end, you going to be all right if you surrender to the Lord. But what I can't do is sacrifice my godliness and my well-being for you to be okay and me to be damaged. The Lord wants more for you than that. So when we gather next month, we're going to pick right back up right here about ways to begin exiting out of deadly destructive and demonic relationships, how to walk away, when you know it's time to say get out, and what ways does God provide for us to exit out of these kind of relationships. Um, I thought we'd have time for questions. It's nine, so do me a favor. Um, we take email questions. That I've got some in that I want you to know I did receive. I'll be reading them next month because they fit better. Um, with this, especially these questions about folk dating in church and stuff going wrong and how y'all make up, we got to... <laughs> we got some work to do. We got some... Uh, how you break up and go to the same church? Yeah. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> That's real talk. You come to 7.30, he go to 11.30. That's what you do. And may the Lord watch between me and thee while we're absent. Listen, I'm going to close this out in prayer. Here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Um, one, please forgive me for exiting right on out. Some of you all know I'm in school. I've got a ginormous paper due on Friday. I've got to go back home and try to finish working on. Um, if you're here tonight and maybe you desire some prayer, maybe you desire to come to know Jesus Christ, maybe you want to join our church family, we've got some deacons and some associate ministers that will stand at the altar afterwards. Just come up let them know what you need. And it'll be their joy to pray with you and to share the love of Jesus with you. I'm praying that God will keep us safe and sound till the next time we're able to meet together again. I thank you all for sharing a Wednesday night with us here at Kaya. We pray safe travel for our friends who've come all the way down from New York, from wherever you may be, that God will give you safe travel back. If you're able, won't you stand with me? Let's close in prayer. Let's pray. God, you've proven that even when I get myself into some things I should not have, you're the God who makes a way out. Sometimes it takes courage. Sometimes it takes patience. And every time it takes faith. But you always deliver us when our hearts are open to be led by your spirit. Lord, tonight I want to pray over a brother or sister that may be unequally yoked, that you begin to prepare and pave a way for them to be delivered. It is not your will for us to be yoked with someone trying to control us, but you've called us to be connected with those that assist us, those that encourage us, those that help us become more fully what you destined and designed us to be in our mother's womb. So, Lord, be with us now until we're able to meet together again in this space, in this place. 
I'm praying for safe travel home, Lord, that there be no hurt, harm, or danger. Lord, that you allow us to get some good sleep tonight. I mean, no worry, no waking up in the middle of the night, mouth wide open, drool sleep, God. That I may wake up refreshed and the joy of the Lord be my strength. Bless my neighbor on my left and my right. Give them whatever they stand in need of, Lord. And we promise to give your name all the praise because you're worthy and we love you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Go in the grace of God. May the grace of God go with you.